Hey folks, we're on our way. My name is Dave Palachik. I am the National Director of MUFON Canada, along with Rob Freeman, UFO World Explorer, and his team on our way to the Bruce Peninsula to shoot anomalies over the Bruce Nuclear Energy Facility. There's been a lot of reports lately of unexplainable activity around the nuclear centers in Canada. We have chosen to go to Bruce. Tonight we're going to set up with uh, Rob's weapons of mass detection plus some new, brand new digital additions. And the team is going to stay out there all night in the dark and hopefully we're going to catch something very unusual. So come along and uh, enjoy the trip. And this is, uh, this is hoping to be a really fun, exciting evening. Thanks. Okay, so one of two things. This either isn't the spot where we were last time, or the water's up very high and we were out there because it was all kind of gravel and sand. But let's take a look here and see what we got. I think that's how we work. But it also looks like there's a road or something there. Let's walk back here and check it out. We might have to check it out somewhere else. See, even here, it wouldn't be a very good view. You can see how high the water's up because this is all... Yeah. Let's check out that other area. There this land was all there before. It's, it's gone. gone. Well, there is a dock further out that's a foot underwater, and it should have been at least a foot above water, so we've yeah. got a lot of water. You're showing me a picture, and it looks like that outcropping there. See, this is where we are now, and there used to be land there. What, isn't that it there? I think that is it. Because you're there's the blue dot, and I think that's... And we were looking let's, across let's go to around the there. plant. Let's go around there. Now, what we can do, uh, it doesn't go any further. That's all underwater now. There's another road here. Let's try this one. Okay. Once again, this was all higher ground before. The water has come up about three feet. So we're gonna set up the equipment here and I'm just gonna work out of the back of the car. Um, Dave's got his equipment as well. We're gonna have lots of camera equipment set up here facing over the plant. We've got night vision, we've got visible, we've got full spectrum, we've got thermal. Dave, you have all of your... We brought security cameras with security internal camera. motion detection and very low lux light detection, okay. so we're, we've got it all. We're covered, and you know, this whole thing about nuclear power plants, there's been many, many sightings around them. Um, there seems to be a correlation to anything with power, large amounts of power, whether it's earthquake, fault lines, thunderstorms, volcanoes, um, coal-fired power plants, but especially nuclear-powered plants. And even the nuclear strike group, is where they had the tic tac. Right. You know, there was all that nuclear power there. So. Well, Nimbus is a nuclear powered uh, aircraft carrier, so. Exactly. It attracts them themselves. So, you know, there's something about it, and we want to find out. Dave, uh, you're the executive director of MUFON Canada. You see all the reports coming in. I do. Do you see a lot of reports around power plants? And we're actually doing, let me tell you Rob, we're doing a study on it right now. I have one of my field investigators doing a complete study of Canada because last year when I was at, in Oshawa, uh, we sat on the highest hill in Oshawa. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can clearly see Darlington and you can see Pickering off in the distance. We captured some things I'm still analyzing. I still cannot figure out what we got, but something went back and forth between the two facilities.
Those that are two nuclear speed. power plants two nuclear in southern Ontario. In southern Ontario. So uh, one of our field investigators is doing a big report. We hope to have it out later this fall on every nuclear facility or high output and uh, power plants in Canada. It's become that much. We're getting that many reports, so we're we're doing an investigation on it separately. You put this guy over here. Say, Rob, where are you going? Because I have just a couple little tripods I'd like to set up. You're yeah. going to sit here. I'm going to sit the little one between so it doesn't get in any way. Uh, interference, that's the security camera. Okay. And then my time lapse is going on this one. I remember looking across to the plant last time we were here. I also brought my 360 if you want to look at the stars. Okay. Straight up. I brought my 360. So Rob, I'm going to get ready to bring out the security camera to add to uh, our usual mix of uh, cameras for the uh, weapons of mass detection. And as I was saying earlier, this is the first time we're going to be using a electronic security camera. This is a 3 megapixel camera that has internal motion detection and very low lux so it can see practically in the dark. We're going to add this to the mix to see what happens differently. This will only record on motion. Um, it does need a netbook in order to view through it, but that's fine. We've got that and it's all portable. We don't need 110 volts. We've got po portable power packs, 12 volts, and uh, we're hoping this is what happens. Later in the middle of the night, we're going to switch to a 16 megapixel one. And hopefully this is the way to go in the future. Here we go. Start with this. This is some time-lapse stuff. We've got time-lapse infrared, time-lapse visible, and video full spectrum. So that's going to go on this tripod right here. I'm working into the sun, so it's kind of difficult. Okay. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, here we go. There you go. Oop, you need help, huh? You're clear. See, now it's a little bit lighter. Yes. This is a meaner and leaner WMD. This is version okay. 2.1. Okay, there we go. Because we've got more expeditions around the world and a couple of the things we weren't really being used, so I'm just I've just got on here the stuff that really gets used, you know? I took the spotting scope off because really with that night vision wide angle. That uh, is all I really need at nighttime for spotting. You were having to use the uh, iPhones on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We're going to use our 100 millimeter to focus directly into the plant. And look in the front door, basically, but no, we're shooting over top. And. Uh, hook it up to an interval timer and take a picture, one picture every minute. Let's see what we can get. Wow, that sun is something. <laughs> oh, what a shot. That is fantastic. Yeah, I think the water's coming up a little bit. This tripod was on dry land when I first set it up. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, you know, it won't hurt anything. So hopefully you won't, uh, you won't have more. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Are you going to put that on right I'm now? I'm going to put it on right now. Oh. Do you have Bob on your hat? Look at that. Look what he's got. Okay. Another anomaly of the night. This was a charged battery. If you look, it says one minute left. So I had to change it. This was fully charged. Okay, so anomaly right here. Enjoy. What about you, Dave? Enjoy the crowd. Fully charged netbook. It wouldn't come up. I had to put it on AC. I'm using the AC uh, output of the battery to get the netbook to power up. What is going on tonight? <laughs> Anyways, we're up and live, so we're going to see the security cameras very soon. So let's look at the at the plant like that, and now we'll focus it. And this will be three megapixel camera. Look how sharp that is. That's extremely sharp. Okay guys, I'm going to include the tree in the picture. 
so that we have a reference of height. We know how far away the plant is. We can look up the dimensions of the plant. Now we know we have a 25 foot tree in the foreground. With those two points, we'll be able to take and uh, figure out the size of anything that we detect above the plant. That's the third unknown. So we're good to go. So I've already had to change the batteries on these because they were all dead, fully charged. The batteries for the thermal camera are dead, they were fully charged. Um, you've already had the gimbal mess. Okay, that one is set to go, and this one is now set to go, and this one has to be adjusted. This is the astrophotography uh, star finder, star tracker uh, motor system. So what it is, if you want to take pictures of stars, and you point out and use long exposures, you'll get star trails. You'll get those nice curves that people seem to like. But if you're trying to get deep into a nebula, you want that star to be solid at all times and never moving. This thing rotates at the same speed the Earth does, so the star is always dead center in the middle of the camera that's shooting. By taking multiple pictures, you stack them and suddenly you can see lights appear that you don't see with your naked eye. You see those deep nebula pictures. The reason I'm using it here tonight is I suspect that we might have anything uh, coming in will be coming from a certain constellation which I'm looking at. So if we get any movement this will also be able to get it very d detailed because it's not getting star tracking, it's not wavering all over. So I'm hoping if anything comes down we're going to see where it comes from. So you were asking me, Rob, about these security cameras. We know we've set the, the sensitivity for the motion detection, so it only triggers on motion and we're not mm -hmm. recording all the mm -hmm. time. You said, what if we need to take still a snapshot? Well, there you go. If I hit that button right there, we have now taken a 16 megapixel snapshot. snapshot. Boom. It's and right now, uh, you've got it set up for motion just in the sky? Just in the sky. Yeah. Yes, yeah. only in the sky. Because there's waves coming in on the water that would yeah. trip it as well. Well, it was. We showed the sensitivity was yeah. set so high it was tripping. Yep. So now it's uh, basically only tripping on Mark walking out in front of the camera and, uh, and birds way out. So we've had all kinds of anomalies happening all night here with batteries dying. And my infrared Sony right here, about four or five minutes ago, it just quit. And the visible time lapse here, Sony, it quit as well. Now, these are all connected to a big battery right here. I can see it. And there's still 43 minutes of runtime left, 11% of the battery. So, and they can handle the cold. It's not that cold. It's maybe about 10 degrees right now Celsius. So that's like, I don't know, 50 Fahrenheit. And my Sony, uh, or my, sorry, my um, Nikon camera is running just fine. So, don't know. I've never had it happen where both Sonys have quit. And we've had Just a lot of that tonight, eh, guys? Yeah, um, you've you've had with your camera equipment, you've had the gimbal fail several times. You had your Sony, you had the battery say exhausted, come back on again. Yeah. Then it said exhausted again. I had my thermal batteries die. I had two other batteries, these big fat batteries. Both of them were dead. So it's been one battery anomaly after another. And Dave, you had several things happen. Quite as well. a few things happened too. So <clears throat> I just checked my big battery pack that's in your trunk. It seems to be dying quickly right now. I don't know why. And your laptop <clears throat> too. The laptop. <clears throat> yeah, it got it up, got it up and running, but I don't know. I couldn't get the arsenal to run. 
that nice little computer uh, computer system for the camera, it would not even stay powered on, and it was fully charged. I still checked. I checked it an hour ago. It still says fully charged, but it won't stay powered up. Is it possible that? Well, these are all regulated and everything inside. There's computer chips, so they're providing the vet, the voltage that these cameras need. So, don't know what's going on. I've I've had very cold conditions before, and I've never had problems with the Sony's. So I, I really have no idea.